Meet Nathan Benjamin Trapozano, a 24-year-old full of promise, and his wife Jennifer. Amidst the hum of life in Indianapolis, their world was one of shared values and deep faith. But little did they know that a routine morning walk on April 1, 2014, would lead to a heart-wrenching tragedy that would shake their lives to the core. As we delve into this shocking story, one question remains. How could a simple morning stroll transform into a life-altering event that would leave a community devastated and a family forever change? Hi, and welcome back to Crime Case Files. If you are new here, please consider subscribing, as it helps us motivate to create more intriguing content for you. We would like to extend our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Nathan Trapozano, who fell victim to this unimaginable act. Let's have a look at the case of Nathan Trapozano. Indianapolis, a city steeped in history and brimming with vitality, beckons with its unique blend of urban charm and Midwestern warmth. As the capital and largest city of Indiana, Indianapolis has evolved from a modest trading post into a thriving metropolis with a character all its own. Nestled in the heart of the state, Indianapolis boasts a population of around 900,000, making it a vibrant hub of culture, commerce, and community. Known as the Crossroads of America, the city's strategic location has contributed to its growth as a center for transportation and commerce, with numerous highways converging here. Beyond its logistical significance, Indianapolis holds cultural treasures that capture the essence of American heritage. The city's most iconic event, the Indianapolis 500, is a legendary auto race that draws motorsport enthusiasts from around the globe. The race takes place at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, a historic track that has become synonymous with speed and excitement. The downtown skyline is a testament to the city's growth with modern skyscrapers coexisting harmoniously alongside historic architecture. Monuments like the Soldiers and Sailors Monument at Monument Circle honor the sacrifices made during times of conflict. Indianapolis's neighborhoods reflect its rich diversity and close-knit communities. From the trendy Mass Ave District to the rejuvenated Fountain Square area, each neighborhood adds its own flavor to the city's tapestry. Yet beyond the cultural landmarks and economic vibrancy, Indianapolis's story is woven with the lives of its residents. It's a place where individuals forge connections, dream big, and confront challenges head in. For Nathan and Jennifer, two lives that intersected in this city, their journey would take an unexpected and tragic turn, leaving an indelible mark on the tapestry of Indianapolis's history. Nathan Benjamin Trapozano, who was 24 years old, and his wife, Jennifer, were two of those residents. Nathan was the fourth of five children and came from a large and close-knit family. His brother remarked that despite the fact that Nathan was younger than him, he looked up to him so much that it was surprising. In addition to his academic success, he was also an accomplished musician and athlete. In addition to being a skilled pianist and violinist, he held a black belt in martial arts. He was humorous and brilliant, but at the same time, he never lost his humility and graciousness. He was accepted into Ball State University and was working on a degree in classical studies, which included Latin, Greek, and classical studies. It was here that he met the woman who would eventually become his wife, Jennifer, who was attending school to become a nurse. They were inseparable and shared a great deal in common, including the same morals, values, and a very strong Catholic faith. The duo was inseparable and had a lot in common. Jennifer mentioned that she admired his quirky personality and how intelligent he was. He never failed to make her laugh, and he encouraged her to improve herself in all facets of her life. After some time, the couple uprooted their lives and moved to Indianapolis, where Nathan found work at Ivy Tech Community College as a computer programmer. When they found out they were going to be parents, Jennifer was in the middle of her training for the military. When they found out that they were going to have a daughter, they could not contain their excitement, and they chose the name Cecilia Marie almost immediately. A few more months went by, and then March 2014 was almost over. Nathan and Jennifer were busy getting ready. 
they were looking forward to a number of memorable and eventful days in the near future. Only a few short weeks remained till Cecilia's due date. The 11th of May marked the beginning of their married life together, which also happened to be Nathan's 25th birthday a week later. It is safe to say that there was a lot happening for the young couple, but the prospect of Nathan becoming a parent was by far the most exciting thing for him. He was quite excited to finally meet his daughter. Nathan had a history of being an extremely active person, therefore on April 1st, 2014, he got up at his usual early hour. He made it a point to go for a brisk walk or go for a run every single day. He had been going to the gym in the evenings as usual, but he had recently made the decision to switch things up so that he could spend more time with Jennifer in the nights after he got off work and before he went to bed. Nathan was getting himself ready for an early morning walk around the neighborhood that would last for one hour just before 5 a.m. in the morning. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. He simply walked the same routes he always did, past the stores he often passed, and on roads that he was extremely familiar with. He sneaked out of the room, taking his worn-out MP3 player, his headphones, and his rosary beads with him. Jennifer was fast sleeping. A person who lives within a few minutes' walk away reported hearing a loud popping sound at 5.50 a.m. in the morning. When she peeked out the window, she saw that Nathan had fallen to the ground and was yelling for assistance. She immediately dialed 911 before running outdoors. She added that by the time she reached Nathan, she could see that he was only wearing his joggers. He did not have any shoes or a shirt on, and all of those items were lying around in disarray on the ground. She was able to make out a minor bullet wound in his stomach, but she observed that there was not much blood. Nathan was obviously in a state of shock at this point, but he was still conscious and appeared to be in a reasonably alert state. Nathan's condition, on the other hand, started to rapidly deteriorate five minutes later, right around the time when the ambulance and the police arrived on the streets. He was no longer able to speak, was unable to provide the authorities with any information, and was struggling for air as he lay there. They were able to bring him back under control and then they transported him to the hospital, where he immediately underwent an operation for an emergency. Jennifer awoke a little after 7 a.m. in the morning, perplexed by the fact that her husband was still not at home and was getting ready for work. Even though he had made sure not to take anything expensive with him when he left the house, his phone was still sitting on the kitchen table when he returned. She grabbed her coat and began walking the paths that he generally walked in an effort to calm herself down, but she was aware that something was seriously wrong on some level. Nathan passed away at 7.40 in the morning despite the best efforts of the doctors and surgeons who were treating him. Jennifer, who was still out strolling, turned a corner and found the street completely blocked off with yellow tape, and police were flooding the area. She ran over there as quickly as she could and informed them that her husband had gone out for a walk but had not returned home, and that this was in the exact midst of his path. However, the only thing that they were able to tell her was that there had been an incident. Because the victim did not have any identification on him at this time, the authorities were unable to provide Jennifer with any further information on the incident. She showed them a picture of Nathan that she had on her phone and she asked them if this was the way he appeared in real life. The officers were aware that it was the same individual, so they took her in a stealthy manner to one of the police cars, where they sat her down and broke the awful news to her. Jennifer would then find out that the love of her life had passed away when she was only five weeks away from the expected date of delivery. One of the detectives stated, he had his whole life in front of him, never been in trouble before, never been a problem and was minding his own business doing what anybody in our community should be able to do, and that is to take a morning walk. The shot casings found nearby matched a gun with a .40 caliber, which the officers claimed was an unusual size and not one they saw very often. They located him close to where the shell casings were. Jesse, the proprietor of the tire business, was familiar with Nathan and saw him stroll past the establishment on a daily basis. When Jesse saw Nathan, he would give him a kind wave. After having his home broken into a couple of months earlier, 
the homeowner had recently installed surveillance cameras that faced the parking area where Nathan was discovered. Fortunately for the authorities, these cameras were facing in the direction that Nathan had been located. Although the video was extremely grainy and fuzzy, it did a good job of capturing everything. One could see Nathan Speed strolling down the road, and someone was following him who eventually started running in order to keep up with him. Later on in the video, the authorities detected the appearance of a second person who appeared to be collaborating with the perpetrator of the shooting. Due to a number of self-explanatory factors, the second half of the CCTV has never been completely made public. At one time, it appeared as if Nathan was lifting his hands as if to signal that he was obeying and would do anything they wanted him to do. However, the two individuals backed him into the parking lot, where Nathan was then shot. As soon as Nathan got out, they made their escape down the main road. The woman who had phoned 911 was the only witness they had, but by the time she arrived at the scene, the suspects had already fled the scene. When the police began questioning locals about their experiences in the neighborhood, things became much more difficult. They all agreed that it was a terrible reality that something like this frequently occurs. The rate of gun violence in their neighborhood had steadily increased over the course of several years, with multiple shootings taking place. Someone mentioned that just in the past few months there has been an alarming number of homicides and shootings. One of the hypotheses that the police were working with was that it was some type of initiation ceremony for a gang. However, another possible motivation, and one that they thought was more likely, was that it was an unsuccessful effort at robbing the business. According to his family, Nathan's habit of never going out for a stroll with any cash, credit cards, or his phone rendered this behavior on his part even more perplexing. The video was given to specialists, who were able to improve it just enough so that they could determine the apparel that the gunman was wearing, but other than that, there was no further information. Early on Tuesday morning, a married man who was about to become a father was shot and killed while walking not too far from his house. He was 24 years old. However, his loved ones and friends assert that viewing him solely as a victim of senseless violence would be an incomplete perspective. He embodied the kind of person many aspire to emulate, a sentiment shared by those who knew him closely. Nathan's impact was so profound that even Brandon Stanley, currently a senior at Ball State, expressed a desire to have emulated Nathan during his own college years. Their paths initially crossed at the university four years ago, and their reconnection occurred through their involvement with Holy Rosary Church. Brandon highlights Nathan's deep religious commitment as a defining trait. The tragic incident unfolded just after Nathan had finished his morning rosary prayer, a practice he often combined with his jogging or walking routine. The shooting occurred while he was engaged in this familiar morning ritual. It's essential to note that the statement he had just finished his morning prayer of the rosary when the shooting took place already conveys the same information as the following sentence. The event took place when he was going about his normal morning routine, which consisted of praying while he prayed while jogging or walking. Therefore, the latter sentence is redundant and can be omitted for clarity. And despite the fact that Nathan's life was cut short in a sad manner, his loved ones and friends believe that the true tragedy would be to allow his passing to define him. The investigation into Nathan's death continued for another week before the police made a significant breakthrough. As they began to investigate any other shootings that may have occurred in the vicinity around the same time, it came to light that just 18 hours after Nathan had passed away, a 16-year-old named Simeon Rahim Adams, who went by the nickname Red, was transported to the hospital in serious condition with a gunshot wound to the neck. Simeon Rahim Adams was a victim of the same incident that had killed Nathan. A man named Eric had fired three rounds at him in self-defense after he had fired three bullets at him first. In addition, Simeon was a suspect in the burglary of a gun shop that occurred one week earlier, in which 30 weapons were taken. On April 1st at 3 a.m., only two hours before Nathan was shot, he and two other guys had attempted to steal a car from outside of a strip club. 
They were only prevented from doing so when the bouncer caught them in the act of stealing the car. Nathan had been walking less than a mile away from the strip club when the shooting occurred, indicating that the person who opened fire and whoever was keeping watch had the same clothes. When the investigators learned about this, they knew it was necessary for them to question Simeon. Not only was it established that he was there in the same location as Nathan's shooting at the same time, but he was also now under investigation for the attempted murder of another person. And the shell shells that were discovered close to Nathan's body matched those of some guns that had been stolen from the shop. However, due to the fact that he was in such a precarious state and was currently hospitalized, they were required to make contact with the people who were closest to him first. The more people the police spoke to, the more they heard the alias Red being thrown around which connected him to a variety of occurrences and crimes that occurred throughout the region. And those he knew were identifying him in every picture lineup that they displayed. Martis McGraw was Simeon's cousin, and he expressed willingness to participate in the conversation. When he was shown the surveillance tape from the front of the tire shop, he affirmed without hesitation that the person in the video was his cousin. He even revealed that he had been present himself for a portion of the morning and validated all of Simeon's actions and maneuvers by doing so. The other man heard on the tape was located and questioned after his identification. When it came to the murder of Nathan, the police were able to eliminate all suspects with the exception of Simeon after this. They were looking for this specific individual. Martis revealed Nathan's identity to the police officer Simeon Ronald and ordered him to halt. Then, Simeon made him walk between the strip club and the tire store where he worked. He forced him to disrobe by instructing him to take off his shirt, and then Simeon opened fire after the man raised his hands in the air. Another man reported to the police that Simeon was the one who woke him up on April 1st by pounding on his door early in the morning. He claimed that he was short of breath and told him that the police were looking for him because he had gotten into what he referred to as a struggle with someone and shot them. He indicated that he had shot the person. Simeon overcame the early doubts expressed by the medical staff over his chances of survival and eventually reached a point where he was healthy enough to communicate with the authorities. They informed him of everything that they knew, and after that, the 16-year-old was placed under custody. Soon, he would be charged with murder, attempted robbery, and carrying a pistol without a license as an adult. These charges would be brought against him. In 2015, a little more than a year after Nathan's death, Simeon Adams entered a guilty plea to the charge of murder. The members of Simeon's legal team, as well as his friends and relatives, have commented on his terrible upbringing and youth. For example, he lost his mother to drowning when he was only 13 months old, and his father spent years going in and out of prison. He had his first brush with the law when he was just 10 years old and continued to have run-ins with law enforcement throughout his life. His uncle, who had assisted in his upbringing, claimed that he was always getting into mischief, but I did not believe that he was capable of something like this. It was common to see him chuckling as he entered and exited the courtroom, and when it came time for his punishment, not much had changed. The judge asked him in a forthright manner whether he understood the effect that his behavior had on the Trapozano family and whether he was sorry for it. He responded to her in a direct manner saying no ma'am and nothing else. After this, the young man who confessed to killing an Indianapolis couple who had just gotten married and was expecting a child would spend a significant amount of time behind bars. A judge in Marion County gave Simeon Adams, then 18 years old, a sentence of 55 years in prison for the murder of Nathan Trapezano. According to the laws of Indiana, Simeon can be eligible for release after serving 27 years in prison if he gets credit for his good behavior and has already done some of his sentence. In that case, he will have already reached the age of 45. After the fact, he was sentenced to an additional 12 years in prison in connection with the shooting of Eric which was the incident that initially landed him in the hospital. This sentence of 12 years must be fulfilled in a continuous fashion. The passing of Nathan had a significant effect on everything. Everyone came together to support Jennifer, 
and a GoFund account was established so that she, Cecilia, and his family could receive financial assistance. Donations brought in more than $170,000. Jennifer showed an incredible amount of fortitude and determination to proceed as she normally would have. She graduated from graduate school with honors and is now working as a physician's assistant less than a year after she had to say goodbye to Nathan. In addition, the Nathan Trapuzano Memorial Foundation was established, and its purpose is to provide emotional and financial support to children who have suffered the loss of a parent. They hold a fundraising event that they call the Nate Walk, which is a five-kilometer walk in Nate's honor because it is one of his favorite things to do. People can also participate electronically in these walks, which take place once a year in Indianapolis and Pennsylvania, respectively. Cecilia, Nathan's daughter, has been granted a remarkable opportunity, a full scholarship covering both years of her education at Ivy Tech Community College, where Nathan had previously worked. Reflecting on Jennifer's perspective, the journey of motherhood has illuminated the fact that this role isn't solely about personal independence. Instead, it entails a profound responsibility for the well-being of another. It necessitates a shift away from self-centered actions to a life of selflessness for their sake. While Jennifer may not have been entirely aware of the extent of her capabilities then, and even now, there are moments when the weight feels heavy and the heart aches. However, she showers Cecilia with all the love she can muster. Cecilia brings Jennifer immense joy and lightens her days. Amid the occasional waves of sadness due to Nathan's absence, there is a reassuring belief that he's watching over them. It's certain that Nathan wouldn't want Jennifer to be sorrowful in Cecilia's presence. Rather, he'd want her to embrace happiness and cherish their moments together. Jennifer stated that it seems as though time stands still and that it moves far faster than she is able to keep up with it. She goes to Nathan for guidance whenever she is unsure of herself or when she is having a challenging day with Cecilia. She explained, I have a voicemail from him on March 31st. 2014. I have listened to it over and over and over again. His voice sounds so familiar still, like it was yesterday. I miss him. I miss everything about him. In so many ways, it feels like he has only been gone for ten seconds, and yet it feels like he has been gone for a hundred years. What are your thoughts about this case? Let us know in the comment section below. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.